And now for the star attraction, Miss Brenda Edwards and Miss Kathy Spaniard. We thank you all for coming and Brenda's family for coming in and being with us. The Women in Stone created Legacy two years ago. The Legacy series is to explore and celebrate the successful careers of influential women in the natural stone industry. We hope that their stories will inspire future generations of women leaders to pursue their dreams. By learning from their challenges and triumphs, future industry leaders will be motivated to succeed and help industry thrive. And now I would like to call up a special guest, Joe Delico. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Um, it's a great honor to, uh, I'm gonna get emotional. It's a great honor to introduce two wonderful ladies. Uh, I'm going to start with Kathy Spainer, who I've known for many, many years. Um, dedicated, loyal, hardworking, so important to the Natural Stone Institute, the Building Stone Institute, the Natural Stone Council, the Standard. My God, I've watched her work and I've watched what she's done. Absolutely incredible. Then we go to Brenda Edwards. <laughs> Um, I could spend the day here. Uh, I met Brenda 25 years ago, give or take, and uh, we somehow got saddled as myself as president and Brenda as treasurer of the Building Stone Institute, I think around 2001 or two. And as a result of that, we became very close. She's my best friend. Um, partner, dedicated hard worker. We're partners in two companies in Indiana. And uh, she pushes me and Tevin and Shane <laughs> uh, to perform the best that we possibly can. You never say no to Brenda. You say, yes, ma'am. Uh, her accomplishments are incredible. I'm going to leave that to Kathy to expand on, but uh, people like Brenda only come along once in a lifetime. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Joe. And now we're going to turn it over to Kathy. Thank you. Um, I, too, am very honored to be asked to be here and to be with my best friend, talking about her and celebrating her legacy. Um, I also want to comment on how the committee was at absolutely fantastic in terms of putting this together and doing a lot of interviews and prep of this. And with that, we had a lot of content to work with. So thank you, the committee. You did a great job. So Brenda, are you ready? <laughs> Certainly. <laughs> Let's start out with how you got into the stone industry and a little bit of history about Texas Stone Quarries and under the Edwards ownership. I got into the stone industry. By the way, thank you, committee, the Legacy Committee. Uh, this is quite an honor. Um, I'm a crier, and all of you know that. <laughs> so hang in there with me is all I can tell you. Um, OK. Thank you, girls. I appreciate all of you. So getting into the industry, how did I you... I got into the industry strictly by accident. Um, I thought everything was built with wood and brick, and little did I know. <laughs> so there, uh, my husband had a lot of farmland, ranch land, and a geologist from Dallas, Texas came out and talked to him and said that they wanted to coral drill and see if there was limestone there, that he had someone interested in, in limestone and so forth. So the core drilling was done and it was turned out to be, be beautiful limestone. 
So American Limestone out of Dallas came in and leased the land. And um, it started out, it was, you know, just a great partnership type thing or leasey. And the two-year contract actually expired and was renewed for a year. And my husband and the man got crossways, and that was the end of that. And Connie, my husband, said, Buddy, I'm going to put you out of business, and I'm going to start my own stone company. And I had worked for him for quite a few years, and he said, Hang on, we're fixing to have a stone company. And I'm going, Are you kidding me? <laughs> uh, so that's pretty much how I learned about the stone industry. I knew absolutely nothing about it. So what were the things that you did to learn about the stone industry? Well, I was a one-girl office. I answered the phone. I did all of the accounting. I did all the samples. Uh, I cleaned the toilets, and I think everybody saw that there was a photo out here that I'm in the fish pond cleaning the fish pond at the office. So I did about everything, and I started getting involved in the Building Stone Institute. And uh, I found out that I had a lot to learn, an awful lot to learn. I knew nothing about it. So I actually, um, I was like a sponge. I wanted to find out everything there was to know about it. And there was a buddy out of California named John Bastoven, and some of you probably knew him. He's deceased now. And um, he was, as far as I was concerned, one of the very innovative and uh, knew more about stone than I knew I'd ever learn about stone. And... Um, he was absolutely fabulous. He was introduced me to Joe Delacroix, and the two of them hung out together, and I figured out that I wasn't the type, uh, I didn't like to go shopping and everything that the other women liked to do. So mm -hmm. I started asking questions of the two of them and uh, it was like, okay, John, I have a question. And they both got to where they wouldn't, they wanted to run from me when I said, <laughs> okay, Joe, or okay, John. And they'd go, uh, you know, he, she's going to ask a G in questions. And I still ask questions. Uh -huh. um, but I learned an awful lot from the two of them. And I traveled. And the more I traveled, the more I learned. And the more I learned, the more I wanted to get, I wanted to learn more. Um, so okay. that's pretty much it. Good, good. No, that was perfect. Um, how long was Connie involved before you took over the reins? Not too long. <laughs> <laughs> you were good at asking questions then, right? <laughs> she could do this. <laughs> um, Connie loved to play. <laughs> And he was extremely good at it. <laughs> and so his thing was he wanted to buy a piece of equipment so he could come to the plant and play with it, like oh. a, a balustrade machine. And he was just having a wonderful time. Now, we had an order for 2500 oh. As a matter of fact, it was a Gallegos uh, project in here in... Uh, Cherry Hills, Colorado, 2,500 balustrades. And Connie's out there, I turned my head, and he's out there to, to play with it. And I said, we've got production. Well, he didn't even know what the, the word production meant. So um, it, it caused some friction. Oh, okay. <laughs> Perfect answer. And uh, so we had to sit down and discuss this situation. <laughs> and um, one time I actually quit. Oh, uh, no. I did. And um, so we got past that, and he never came back to the <laughs> <laughs> So 
so to what's the your, office. To the yeah, office. Okay. <laughs> so. What's the what's your favorite industry event that you like to attend? Ooh, that's a hard one to answer, Kathy. Um, the Marmamac in okay. Verona, Italy, is one of, is the pinnacle, I would say, mm -hmm. and. Uh, the Building Stone Institute and the Marble Institute in America, which is now the NSI, um, all of them. I, I've enjoyed every one of them. Okay. None more than another one, I don't think. But the more you go, the more you learn, and the more you meet new people. And I love people, and I love to meet new people. Everybody sitting in this room, I, I know pretty well, and... They're friends of mine, so it's pretty wonderful. Thank you. So when I'm going to get into your leadership roles, okay. so you're not only a leader in the stone industry, but you have all, all these businesses. You're very diverse in terms of uh, the businesses you have. We know you from the natural stone, but getting to know you, we know you have cotton, oil, cattle. Um, now you're getting into the invent venues. <laughs> So you're we all invited. <laughs> we, yeah. We want to know um, how you manage all, wearing all those hats on a daily basis. What's your secret sauce? How do you do it? Um, hmm. Well, I've always had a passion. I, I, I'm a workaholic. No matter what I'm working at, I'm a workaholic. I don't like sitting. I don't want. I don't enjoy TV, uh, so I pretty much stay busy. And I've heard several times since I've been here because I've, I've had some health issues, so I haven't traveled in quite in several years. And so this is the first time I've been at a major event in several years, and uh, it's it's wonderful to be back. Mm -hmm. But your plate is full, huh? right? Your plate is pretty full. I think it we're is pretty all amazed full, at but that. It's it's okay. Um, I go. For, I change hats all the time, mm -hmm. daily, and I love every every aspect of my life. Okay. Well, that's very good. Like, yeah. You, you've been cotton, very successful. Cotton farming is my least favorite. Oh, okay. <laughs> Okay. I do not care to cotton still, farm. But you're still managing it, right? Huh? You still manage it. You're leading it. I'm trying to get out of it as fast <laughs> as I can. I'm telling you. Okay, moving along the leadership topic, um, let's start with some of the associations. I know you've been involved in a lot of associations, but the first one, let's start with the Building Stone Institute. You um, joined there. As even Joe mentioned, he was president and you were treasurer in 19... 94, and you served for 12 years. I did. Why? <laughs> Why? <laughs> uh, well, I started out with a passion, and I'm st I started learning, and I, it took me a while. I'm pretty thick-headed, so it took me a while to learn the things that I wanted to learn. And no matter what I did, uh, I mean, I came here this week, and I learned some some things. So no matter what I learned, the next time I went to an event, I learned again, all over. So um, I don't think you. I, I'm not quite the oldest person in this room. <laughs> Duly noted. <laughs> <laughs> but. Um, you know, you're never too old to learn. Mm -hmm. You're really not. Okay. So in 2005, you became the president of the BSI, the Building Stone Institute. Uh -huh. I did. Yeah. <laughs> and um, <laughs> why, I mean, you accepted that position and you served that position. Well, can um, we go back a little bit before that? Sure. Okay. The Building Stone Institute was under the leadership of Dorothy Kinder. And Dorothy was um, trying to get herself retired. Mm -hmm. And there were a couple of people that kind of had to help her along with that decision. And um, 
So Joe became president and Jeff Leonard became his vice president and I was his secretary treasurer or his okay. treasurer. Well, there was a lot going on in the Building Stone Institute at the time. And um, we had a lot of problems and Joe hit it head on and I was right behind him like pushing and I was, I was thrilled to death at being the treasurer of the Building Stone Institute and I got up at the end of my year and I got to announce to the whole organization that we had made $4.23 in interest income. <laughs> and that was a great accomplishment at the time. So mm -hmm. it was, um, it, that's how it all kind of got started. Okay. And I, I, became, I had passion for it. Good. So talk about your presidency. Uh, well, I took over the presidency in 2005 and uh, had a good year, had a great board, absolutely wonderful, great board. And um, I was the only female on the, the board for, I guess, all 12 years, actually. Mm -hmm. And uh, the men were fabulous. You know, if I needed help, they helped. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was great. How did it feel being the only woman on the board? Did you feel that you were included or did it feel awkward? Because I think sometimes um, we get outnumbered. And at that time... I were... never, I, in the industry itself, I never had any problem with any of the guys uh, treating me any differently than what mm -hmm. they were doing. Uh, they gave me the respect of being a woman. They also uh, gave me the respect of being a, a strong woman and having my opinions. And sometimes they agreed and sometimes they didn't. And we mm -hmm. we've been known to go at it. <laughs> but it all seemed to work out, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> So um, what advice would you give for women in terms of getting involved and in participating and developing leadership roles like you've done with the BSI? In the industry itself, in the organizations, I had never had a problem with being disrespected, being talked down to. Um, my problem sometimes was on job sites because I'm a, I'm always have been a hands-on owner and I believed in going to see the projects that we were working on and I was on job site I climbed fences and went over to see the site and I'd get called down about it or whatever um, I I always went on job site and I'm out there in the construction, and I'm still learning. And a lot of project managers would talk very, you know, down to me. I'm a woman. You don't know anything. And I found out that I had to be two steps ahead of all the men. Being the only woman out there on the board or anything else, I had to keep two steps ahead of them. And so I did that. Mm -hmm. I went on job site one time, and uh, this was at Yale University in New Haven, Connecticut. Mm -hmm. And um, they told me that <laughs> I didn't know what I was talking about. And he laid out the, the, uh, the drawings. And I looked at him and I said, that's not the new drawings. I said, you've issued new draw newer drawings than this. He said, no, this is it. And I reached in my back pocket, and I had the full drawing right there. And I said, this is the new one. And he had to back off. So I had to st stay in ahead of what mm -hmm. I was dealing with. Okay. okay. To uh, close out the BSI, you received uh, the Person of the Year twice. It's quite an honor. 
in 2006 and 2010. What did that mean to you? <laughs> yeah, you got the cards, girl. I know. <laughs> um, well, uh, it was quite an honor. Mm -hmm. Quite yeah. an honor. Well deserved. Both times. Well deserved. Another association that you were very involved with was the Natural Stone Council. And there were two big initiatives. One was, um, the, for this segment, let's just talk about the Genuine Stone branding and the checkoff program. And it was kind of a heated topic at the time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and some of heated it topic still is. Brenda. Uh, <laughs> what role did you play in that? Oh, I was the wicked witch from the West. <laughs> um, let's talk about one at a time. How's okay. that? That's okay. Um, the Natural Stone Council. I was a firm believer in the Natural Stone Council. And uh, Mark Fernandez with Lux Stone and John Mackey with Cold Spring Granite. Um, actually started the idea of all the organizations coming together under one roof and everybody talking to each other, which back in those days, you didn't share your information with anybody. And it, to me, it was all wrong. Um, we're all in the same industry and everybody's was afraid somebody was gonna take a secret or something away from each other or whatever. So I was a big proponent of everybody getting in the uh, same room and talking, mm -hmm. okay? I was a big, um, I thought checkoff would be, everybody was having financial problems and I thought checkoff would be a great idea. Um, the standard was a big issue with the Natural Stone mm -hmm. Council. And I was a big proponent of that to the point that I jumped in there and said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this first and mm -hmm. show everybody how to do it and why to do it and so forth. Mm -hmm. But I was a little selfish also because I wanted to see what my company was doing um, in being sustainable. Mm -hmm. So I jumped in there myself, and I went around, and I did all of the research. I did everything. Uh, I remember one day we have a shrink wrap machine that will wrap a pallet of mm -hmm. stone. So I'm out there taking my notes and watching what's going on, and... While we're talking, this machine just keeps going, you know, on and on and on. And I thought, I said, how many times do you normally wrap this pallet? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know. And I said, well, this is costing money. Mm -hmm. So I went, I found out a lot about my company mm -hmm. and going sustainable and it wasn't near as hard as I thought it was. We were doing a lot of good things mm -hmm. correctly. We, I discovered what we were doing incorrectly, and we tried to correct it. So just quickly, um, explain to the group what the Natural Stone Sustainability Program certification is about, just a general. You're much more qualified at that than <laughs> I am, Kathy. <laughs> It's your show. <laughs> no, I, I, I go back to the, um, I, I want to go back to checkoff, but before we do that, we'll, we'll just kind of wrap up the, the sustainability standard. Um, Brenda was actually on the joint committee developing the standard and, um, and getting it to the point where it was passed and approved and then getting it accepted we worked as a team to get it accepted by the industry. So it was basically saying that when we produce stone, we're producing it sustainable to the environment, 
water, mm -hmm. um, and all of the energy use and all of those aspects. So it was a long journey. Not everybody in the industry wanted to take that journey. The very few and, of them yep, wanted to do and, it. And I think, again, you have that attitude that we can do this. And yeah. you were a great role model for me. And Thank you. Um, yeah, the standard. And to that point, when the standard was finally adopted, you were the first to certify to that standard. Yes. And that was quite a big moment for the industry. There's still people out there that are resisting the standard. Mm -hmm. And uh, I hope one of these days it's, it's a normal, mm -hmm. normal thing for everybody in the industry. Right. I really do. I think it's very valuable. And thank heavens, uh, you know, I've got employees sitting right here on this front row. I've got Cindy for 25 years. I've got Vince for 19 years. And I have Jennifer for 16 years. And Jennifer, the, I don't have anything, or of course, y'all. everybody knows I've sold Texas Stone, but Jennifer took over when she came on board, and she does all the recording and everything for the standard, and she's mm -hmm. fabulous at it. But I did the initial mm -hmm. research and everything. Okay. Can we go back to the Natural Stone Council um, checkoff program? Why was that so important, and why were people all wrapped around the axle over that issue? Um, Jim Hayes ought to be up here talking about this one. <laughs> he, he acquired it after. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but you had it started. Uh, you know, the, the checkoff it was a sort of a fundraising avenue for the industry as a whole. And it did not go over well with the industry because everybody was um, trying to to take care of their own business, not looking at the industry as a whole. So it's um, it never passed, and it's been out there for quite a few years. And thank heavens for the natural. Stone Institute mm -hmm. that they have bypassed the checkoff program because I don't think the stone industry is so antiquated about it that mm -hmm. they'll never ever pass one. And uh, so the NSI has now started their foundation and that is a, and they're benefiting other organizations, not just the NSI. Right. And I think it should be noted how actively you were involved with a group of people, and I know Jim, Jim too, with um, lobbying, actually meeting with legislators, congressmen, to get mm -hmm. this passed. So a lot of time and effort. It wasn't a light effort, so thank you. We all had, had our days in Washington, mm -hmm. that's for sure. All right, then there's this initiative that you got started, and the reason we're here today, and that's the Women in Stone. That's Where my baby. That... <laughs> yeah. Tell a, tell a story about <laughs> how the Women in Stone came to be. Well, Jim Hebe came to me one day, and I was the only female on the, uh, at this time it was the NSI. No, it was the Marble Institute of America, which I have to say this. We're going to get to that. Okay. <laughs> huh? Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> you, that's another question? It's coming up. I don't get to see your cards. Right. <laughs> okay. So what was your question you asked? <laughs> How did the Women in Stone get started? Okay. Uh, Jim Hebe, the EVP of the Marble Institute of America, came to me and said, you're the only uh, female on the group, and there is a women in, I don't even remember what he told me, uh, that I just visited with, and he said, don't you think it would be nice to have a women in stone group? And I said, I certainly do. And he said, well, run with it then. And so that was an easy fix right there. 
So why do you think women, the uh, Women in Stone group was necessary? I believe women are organized. I believe women have a passion for what they do. Uh, they listen, they're open-minded. They have, 90% um, of them don't talk men down. Um, I, it's, they needed to be recognized as much in, in the mm -hmm. stone industry as men did. So how have you seen the Women in Stone program evolve in such a short period of time? Because it really has been a short period of time. Well, let's see. I think the first, uh, the first Women in Stone event was in Las Vegas, Nevada. And uh, Polycore hosted a party for the Women in Stone. And Mr. Delacroix looked at me and he said, are you serious? He said, you're not going to get five women at that party. And he said, it's not going to go over. And I think there's uh, someone, correct me if I'm wrong, and there are 900 and some odd members of the Women in Stone today. 2,000. 3,000? 2,000. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> so, hey, what would you like to see the future of the women in stone? Oh, I'd like for it to continue on, and I'd like for, like the Legacy series, um, like I said, I'm older. I would like to see the worth e ethics continue on as we go all the values and the beliefs of the women in stone. Um, I think there's a lot to be learned from the women in stone. Okay, thank you. So in 2017, you were awarded the Pioneer Women, uh, the Women in Stone Pioneer Award, uh, very first one. What significance does that award have hold for you? Um, that one's dear to my heart. Um, sorry. <laughs> it indicated to me that uh, somewhere along the way, I guess I did something right <laughs> in the industry and uh, I didn't do it for myself. I didn't do it for Texas Stone. I truly did it for the industry. So uh, to be recognized the first pioneer woman, I did do a lot of things for the first time, but I enjoyed doing them. I would, would not have done it any differently than I did. Um, and I, frankly, I don't think I deserve any of them any of the awards that I've gotten, oh, and I don't deserve to be here right now either. Yes, you do. I just yes, do what do. I do. No, you do. You do. You've earned it. We're celebrating you. And I, I want to acknowledge that um, you've been a big financial supporter of the Women in Stone, given of your time. And every year, the Women in Stone Steering Committee does an annual retreat, and we do, and Brenda's so she hosts us, and she's so gracious. So again, um, that means a lot to us. I'm going to ask you, why do you do it? <laughs> well, got to turn uh, the tears to. I'll tell you why laughter. I do. I, I decided to ask about having a retreat at my house because at Tice, I never got to go on the floor. I was in meetings all day long, and I never got to go see the booths or do anything much. I was always in a meeting, and frankly, I got tired of meetings. So, um, and I didn't want to miss out on the, the WIS part of it, so I thought, you know, and everybody was kind of going, well, we need to do this, we need to do that, and so it, I said, why don't 
you come to my house, I live out in the middle of nowhere, and no one's going to bother you, do your meetings there. So they came the first year, and uh, I've never seen such dedication with 14 to 15 women. Um, they all get, get along beautifully. Everybody has the same thing in common. They uh, get up, they have a quick breakfast in the morning. They are sitting at my dining room table by eight o'clock in the morning and they take a 30 minute lunch and at five o'clock in the afternoon, yes, they quit and they get their wine. So yeah, it's five o'clock somewhere, right? <laughs> so it has become, and I have enjoyed hosting that. Uh, but they are changing, changing things on me because the first year I did all the cooking, and I did this and that and the other, and. So now they won't let me do all the cooking. They are dividing out each meal. And uh, so we have, we have fun. And even after 5 o'clock, when they do start drinking a little bit of wine, uh, we're still talking business, and you're still learning as, as they go. So, Great. Well, thank you. Um, one of the programs that, that the Women in Stone have is a mentorship program. What does that mean to you? It means a great deal because there, that's, to me, I had John and Joe as a mentor. Uh, not that they wanted to be my mentor, but uh, that's, how I, that's how I learned everything. So the young girls that are coming up, um, they have a mentorship, or they have a mentor, and they're working together and they have goals, and they have certain things that they're reaching, and it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful uh, program, absolutely. And we're talking about the women in stone, but we have many men that also are mentors that help some of these ladies just as much as the women help the girls, mm -hmm. you know? So, yeah, it's a very important program. Yeah, okay, thank you. What's your favorite song? My what? Your favorite song. <laughs> My favorite one? Song. <laughs> song? Yeah, I'm trying to divert your attention. Huh? What is your favorite song? Do you have a favorite song? My favorite song. Well, now that's a great. <laughs> My favorite song. Well, it's got to be an Elvis Presley song. <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs> My favorite song is Just Pretend oh, by Elvis just Presley. Pretend. Okay, good. Thank you. We'll move on to another topic. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, continuing along your leadership roles, um, there was the merger of the oh, Building boy. Stone Institute <laughs> and the uh, Marble Institute of America Who's somewhere that? around 2016. And during the time that the committee made these numerous calls to your friends and colleagues, it was unanimous that, it's, that what came out of it was over my dead body. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so take us on that journey. From the beginning? I guess. Okay. I don't have a clue where I was. It, I, I want to say it was Bethesda, Maryland. Um, and the BSI was really, really struggling at the time. And they had an EVP that had just been released of her duties. And we had a convention fixing to come up. She overbooked. It was just a kind of a mess. And um, I was invited to go to breakfast one morning with seven men. And uh, they kind of, in a roundabout, direct way, <laughs> suggested that the BSI merge with the MIA because we had no hope for the future of the BSI. And 
I listened to everything all seven of them said, and at the end of my meal, which they paid for, <laughs> I shoved my chair back and stood up and threw my hands on my hip and said, over my dead body, will the BSI ever merge with the MIA? <laughs> You want the rest of the story? <laughs> I could ask the question, but that's really what I'm going to ask. Huh? What, how, did, how, did, how did all that end yes. up? Well, okay. The more that I thought about it and everything just was, you know, seemed it, to, it was good mix. And uh, I believe that Jim Heeb was in Indianapolis one time when Joe and I were there. And as past presidents of the BSI, he asked how we really felt about it. And Joe and I both agreed that we thought that it would be a good idea uh, that maybe the merger did happen. So uh, at that point, the ball started rolling, and Jane Bennett was the VP of the Building Stone Institute and Jim of the MIA. And we progressed through it and various different people uh, started working on the project. Mm -hmm. And I was asked to join in some of the meetings in Denver and so forth and so on. And I sat at a table one day and Mr. Osterhout said, Brenda, did you say that over your dead body uh, that you would never uh, have the BSI merge with MIA? I said, I did say that. He said, how do you feel about that now? And I said, well, I've kind of changed my mind, but I'm not quite there yet. So we kept working at it. and. Uh, so when the merger started and actually came to tuition, uh, I was sat across the table from Greg again, and I said, okay, Greg, get your salt and pepper and your knife and fork because I'm going to eat every word I ever said. And I said, I always keep an open mind. So that's the way it all came about. Okay, good. Because you were, at, at the end, I mean, you were one of the biggest advocates of the merger. I was. Yeah. I have You're another... never too old to learn. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's true. Oh, you keep an open mind, like you said. I know. Okay, this is another one of those zing questions, like the favorite song. Are you ready? Oh, boy. I'm just warning you. <laughs> um, who's the best industry person to go to dinner with? Oh, wow. oh, wow. Repeat that question. <laughs> Who is the best industry person to go to dinner with? Hmm. <laughs> well, I have more than one. Give us a couple. She's, she's being very careful here, I see, politically. I am. <laughs> okay. Um, well, Gerald Gallegos was one of them years ago, which I found out earlier this evening that there's probably about three people here that ever really knew Gerald Gallegos, but Gerald was always fun to go to dinner with. And Daniel Wood's another one, because Daniel's always wanting different food to eat, and <laughs> you know, so I'd say Daniel Wood too. Okay, good. Great choices, great choices. <laughs> Okay, well, we're going to get back to that diversification. Men like to eat, and I like to eat. <laughs> oh, there you go. There you go. Okay, being a female leader in the industry, um, you have also diversified your business a bit. You've added your business development. You've added Texa, um, Texacan Stone in 2013, and then most recently Bedford Limestone Supply. Why and why now? Well, I had the... Joe and I had been friends for a long time, and he was having trouble in Indiana with the fabrication and getting stone out correctly and on time and blah, blah, blah. And I was being asked in Texas to fabricate Indiana limestone. 
and it did not make any sense to me to ship blocks of Indiana buff or gray or silver or whatever it is, I didn't know a darn thing about Indiana limestone, to Texas and have me fabricate it and ship it back to job site or even to Indiana. Okay. So Joe and I were talking about this, that one, what's going on in the Indiana belt? So uh, I was in Connecticut and his son came, we were in his office and his son came in and was fussing up a storm about the fabrication in Indiana. And he said, why don't you two get off of your duff and do something up there and go buy something? And I said, you know, that's a good idea. And I thought Joe was going to hit me. <laughs> and he said, have you lost your mind? And I said, no, not at all. So Joe and Kelly and I went to dinner that night, and Joe said, Lance came in and told the story, and he said, and Brenda agrees with him. And Kelly said, well, I don't think that's a bad idea. <laughs> so we, st we started talking about it, and the more we talked about it, the more it started making sense. And um, so we sat down, and most people know that stats show that a partnership is the uh, worst entity there is to, for longevity. So when we really got serious about it, we sat down and we were in his office and uh, started, we had to lay it all out. I mean, his family and my family were totally different. His business and my business were totally different. Everything concerned was totally different. But we decided that, you know, we were going to try it. So we went looking for a company to buy in Indiana. And we had, um, I don't know how many of you know, uh, Ed Walsh with Sturgis Materials. Mm -hmm. But he made a suggestion that we knew that we couldn't operate this company from Texas or Connecticut. And so he made the suggestion that we talk to Kevin, Tevin Norman. Mm -hmm. And we both had been introduced to Tevin. So he was working at a company, and Joe and I went to visit him and ask him what he thought his future was going to hold in the, uh, in the next five years. And he said, well, I want to own my own limestone company. We walked out, and we high-fived each other and said, <laughs> that's it, that we have somebody to work, you know, operate it. Okay. So that's how it all got started. All right. And then later, um, Mr. Norman can't sit still, so he <laughs> wanted to keep growing, and we met Shane. He worked for Texacon, and uh, so we decided that we needed to diversify a little bit. Mm -hmm. So we uh, bought build, uh, Bedford Limestone Suppliers. So that's how both of them got started. Joe and I, at the age we are now, we're on our exit plan. So we're going okay. to be getting out of that. Okay, very good. So we just spent about 30 minutes talking about your involvement and in leadership roles in the associations. And admittedly, there are many more associations that you've been involved with, um, organizations and, and, and whatnot. Um, that we didn't cover. But when you look at that, was your involvement critical to your company's success? By being involved with these associations and leadership roles, did that contribute to the success of your companies? I, I would say yes, it did benefit. I think the, the networking, the um, visiting with various different people mm -hmm. and sharing problems that's you know that's so beneficial to all of us we all have our problems you know it's workforce or it's um, you know equipment no matter what it is if we share our problems with each other somebody may have corrected their company in that and and shared with you and so it helps mm -hmm. you know Yes, I definitely think it's a benefit. To and be then, involved. too, it uh, contributed to your personal success by I being think involved. so, yes, yes. 
No, we're going to get to you. Huh? We're going to get to you personally. To me. You as a person. What makes you tick? What you see is what you get, darling. <laughs> I can tell you what people have been saying about you. <laughs> What what are what have been some of your biggest obstacles or hurdles that you've faced personally and professionally? I lost Connie in 2019, and um, I had some issues there, and the stress caused several different issues. I inherited my eyes, bad eyesight from my father, and the stress of that created big problems for me with my eyes, and that's the reason I haven't been traveling lately. Mm -hmm. uh, prior to that, I had, you know, lung cancer twice, and I survived that, so I have to be a tough old boot if <laughs> nothing else. Well, that was my next question. You know, what, what, what's your toolkit? What, what skill set do you have that you're able to face these head on? I don't think it's skill. I think it's uh, being strong, being determined. Um, just, I enjoy life, and I enjoy what I do, and I have a passion for it. And I, I'm not ready to go, so I'm... Still, I mean, I think a lot of people, since I've been here, people think I've retired just because I sold Texas Stone. I'm not retired. I'm working harder than I have in a long time. But I'm ha I am love what I do. I don't want to sit down. We don't want you to slow down. I don't want to slow down. Yeah. No. So have you ever gotten to a point where you hit a wall or you feel burned out? Never. No. Never. The stone industry gave me a challenge. I bore very easily. And any time I've ever had anything to do, I always got bored at it. The stone industry is so versatile. It's something different every single day. You never know when you walk in that door what you're going to be hit with. And so I have never been bored in the stone industry. Mm -hmm. I, I look forward to get to going to work every single day. That's great. Do you, not, not too many people can say right. that about their That's jobs. True. That's true. That's true. very true. Is there something you do to recharge yourself? What creates energy for you? I honestly can't. I don't know. Never really thought about that. I mean, you're a very positive person. I, I would agree with that. You know, I think attitudes uh, is a lot for everybody. A bad attitude is going to get you nowhere. And mm -hmm. I, I try to stay positive about everything I do, mm -hmm. uh, except cotton farming. <laughs> <laughs> and I just don't have it in me to, <laughs> to stay. Okay. You can't recharge yourself on that one. No, I can't. <laughs> I got it. Um, so in interviewing a lot of your colleagues and friends, um, there was a common theme throughout in terms of you as a person. She's a force to reckon with. That what? She's a force to reckon with. Oh. She's authentic. Once you meet her as a colleague, she becomes your best friend. Now who on earth said that? What, <laughs> what does that mean to you? Uh, hmm. Wow. Can I speak to this person directly after this? <laughs> you have to talk to the committee. <laughs> uh, no. Uh, well, I get from that. Repeat the sentence again. I heard... um, so there's just a common theme in terms of what your, co your colleagues, um, when, they, when they're talking about you, you, they say you're very genuine, authentic. Um, some people feel that you're a force to reckon with. So, like, if you're really determined, you're gonna you're gonna beat them down. Is how I read that. <laughs> get them to get your way. Uh, okay. Um, and then, and then the fact that um, when people meet you, they they really see 
a beautiful person, you become a friend. Well, whoever said it, thank you for the compliment. It was a theme. Uh, There's huh? a lot of people that feel this way. It's a theme. I don't pretend to be anybody that I'm not. I mm -hmm. uh, never have, never will. And like I said a while ago, what you see is what you get. So, um, and I'm pretty outspoken. Really? Um, <laughs> yes, really. <laughs> Uh, if you ask me a question, you're going to get an answer from me. Whether you like it or not, you're going to get an answer from me. So it's, um, I, yes, I have had my battles with people. And, um, but it's something I believed in and I'll stand up for what I believe in every single day of the week. You know, even at the beginning of this whole conversation, um, you, when you started in the industry, you had goals. How have those goals maybe changed over time? When I first got into the stone industry, I didn't have a clue what a goal was in the stone <laughs> industry. Uh, it was so foreign to me. Uh, and I mean, I had to travel because I thought everybody quarried like Texas stone quarried. I had no idea, you know, uh, that everybody did things differently. And when I started traveling um, and to find out that people did it, and this all has to do with the standard also, because in the standard, I thought everyone quarried the same way. I thought what the equipment that I had, everybody had, and they all fabricated the same. Well, I, Joe and John told me that I was just a silly blonde thinking all that. And I started traveling and doing all this and finding out what was out there. And I listened and I learned. And I just, you know, uh, goals, I never even thought of goals. Mm -hmm. I just rode, rode the, the journey. Okay. You've received many awards and accolades in the industry. Um, personally, which ones are the most important to you? Well, I think I've already said it. I think the Pioneer Woman was the pinnacle of all of them. Man. Very special. This one's very special also. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, honestly, I, I have to admit, I was extremely nervous about this one. And I've had people say, why have you been so nervous? You've been up in front of everybody for years. But yes, I have. But I've, it's been a while. And um, I haven't been traveling and seeing everybody. And I have to say, I have enjoyed seeing everyone this trip. This mm -hmm. is fabulous. So I've enjoyed it. Before we get to the last question, where's your happy place? Where is my happy place? My happy place is probably at my house with all my kids, my eight grandkids, my new great granddaughter, and I have a great grandson on the way. So my happy place is there mm -hmm. at my house. Well, as you know, this is um, this is a series is about the legacy series. Mm -hmm. What legacy do you want to leave? What do you want to be known for, Brenda? Just that I enjoyed life. I enjoy the stone business. I, I, these people are my friends. I have a whole different family sitting right out here, mm -hmm. and. I hope I've contributed to all of you. You have. And now you've got me choked up. <laughs> <laughs> so again, you know, it's interesting because throughout these questions, we, um, the committee has given me quotes or statements or adjectives about Brenda and uh, tenacious. I'm sorry? Tenacious. You're tenacious. You're stubborn with conviction. Oh, my goodness. 
you're determined to a fault. How do you that's all me. Yeah, okay. All right. All right. All right. And again, um, I think that, that you're a very strong woman. And um, having this legacy and the, the contributions that you've made to the industry, to your business, um, is significant. How would you describe Brenda Edwards? Well, there's been a lot of words said. <laughs> um, no, what are your words? My words. I am determined. Uh, it's hard to describe yourself. Mm -hmm. I enjoy life very mm -hmm. much. Um, I, I enjoy people. I have a passion for, for the stone industry. Um, it's just been a great journey. It really has. Mm -hmm. okay. And I, I don't know, you know, other people are better at describing you than you are yourself, I think. So we I, I would love to say, oh, I love everything about me. I don't. Uh, but, you know, I try. Yeah. So I think I, I commend the committee because they did a great job in interviewing people and getting some quotes and, and, and whatnot from them in terms of how they feel about you and some of the great storytelling they did and you are doing tonight. Um, what advice would you give women that are either entering the industry or, advan or wanting to advance their career in the stone industry? What advice would you give them? You know, uh, we talked about me going on job site and what, no matter what you're doing, and I, I hear all the time that, that women are having some struggles with the men in the, in the construction industry. And I understand that, and I had my struggles. But, you know, don't use your vinegar, use your honey. It goes a lot further, a lot easier for your life. Um, it's, you've got a long way to go in this industri industry, and you're very well loved in this industry. Uh, more so now with 2,000 People, girls in the WIS, that's fabulous. I didn't know it was up that high. So but yeah, you've got a great, great career out there. And, the, and you know, it takes the men as well as the women. And I want to tell you something. Years ago, the first time I got Person of the Year in 2006, and uh, I went to San Diego to get out of president of the BSI. And I had the great honor of handing all of the past presidents of the Building Stone Institute their new pen that we had designed, got to pin it on each one of the past presidents. And I personally had several, I had seven men that helped me learn what I learned and helped me through my career in the industry. And that was early on in 2006. Mm -hmm. And I love all seven of them. Uh, some of them are not here anymore, but I gave each one of those men a pink t-shirt that Ooh, says wow. there's seven good men. And on the back it says, behind every strong woman. <laughs> and <laughs> very good. Very good. And I actually, I actually tried to get one of the t-shirts and I nobody seems to have the t-shirts. <laughs> I think they all threw them away as soon as I gave them to you. Um, is there anything that, that I didn't ask that I should have asked or any story that you want to share with the group as part of your legacy? Oh, I... Whoever gets my iPad when I'm gone, <laughs> share it because there, I can, there's a lot on my iPad. I've got photos like you would not believe. But no, it's, um, it's been a wonderful, wonderful ride. Okay, what is your favorite cocktail? I bet 90% of these people know what my favorite cocktail is. Okay, then 
Pino Grigio. Pino Grigio. Wow. Uh, okay, so the only thing that's between you and that Pino Grigio right now uh -oh. is question and answer. Uh-oh. Does anyone have a question for Brenda? <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> Do we want to do this? <laughs> You're on a time limit. <laughs> I'd like you to describe to the audience um, your first experience with John Bastoven and myself when you always wanted to tag along with us and John laid down the law to you. Okay. Uh, when, all right, so you've already heard me say that John Bastoven introduced me to Joe. And so I zeroed in and decided that those two could teach me everything I wanted to know. So I said, they were fixing to go somewhere the next morning. I said, can I go? And John said, sure. Be downstairs at 5.15 on the dot. And I said, yes, sir. So next morning, I was downstairs at 5.25. <laughs> and I heard the wrath of John Bastoven. And he looked at me, and he put his arm on my shoulder, and he said, young lady... He said, if you want to hang with Joe and I, he said, when I say be here at 515, you better dang well be here at 515. I don't care what your hair looks like. I don't care what you, no, no makeup. Don't care about any of that. You be here if you want to hang with us. I was never late another day that I ever went anywhere with them. That's a great story. Yes, it is a great story. Anyone else? Questions for Brenda? What were your parents like, and what did you gain from your parents? What were my parents like, and what was the second? What did you gain from your parents? Are you like your parents? Have you? <laughs> I have, okay. My parents were very wonderful, wonderful parents. Um, and my brother is sitting here in the front seat, too. Uh, I am the older sister by 10 years in one week. But uh, my father was very soft-spoken and very easygoing. Mom was the one that disciplined me. Now, he was the golden boy <laughs> with her. <laughs> so uh, I can, they were wonderful parents, absolutely wonderful parents. Um, we traveled a lot. We did a lot of things together. and uh, But mom tr disciplined me, so when uh, dad, she'd say, she needs a spanking. And he'd take me back to the back, and he'd hit the bed <laughs> instead of me on the buns. And i go, oh, you know, and just scream. <laughs> so, it, but then he, you know. So, yes, they were wonderful parents. That's a great question. What was your funnest trip industry-based? What was the, in your mind, most memorable industry business trip? Montana. Elaborate. I have... <laughs> huh? Elaborate. Uh, I, well, I, I will say this. In the stone industry, I traveled a great, great deal. And I have been to every state except two. And it's Iowa and North Dakota. And I missed my chance on North Dakota uh, when Chuck Munson uh, was at Dakota Granite. And I just can't get to those two. The Montana trip was, uh, I had never been to Montana. And we did a life-size replica of Stonehenge. And you just don't pick Montana to go to. You have to have a reason to go. So there was a, um, a, a study tour up there. And it was a great study tour, and I got to go see my Stonehenge, and I, that was one of the, my favorites. It really was. Anyone else? Bye. 
so we just had our first uh, kind of newbie breakout section session, uh, newbies in stone, basically. So what what would your advice to people just getting into the stone industry? Get involved. Get involved with the organizations. Uh, this is one of the best ones there is, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, even though I fought against it, I'm all for it. It's it's fabulous, and the networking you it, you can't learn anywhere what you learn coming to these study tours, the conventions. Uh, they're fabulous. So, Brenda, what would be the the most challenging, the most difficult? Uh, uh, of of your endeavors in, in the stone business. Well, as an owner, <laughs> that's one of them right there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you ask, and I'm telling you. We'll talk later. You know, it's it's not. The it, well, being an owner of a quarry operation and fabrication, you had problems daily. Obviously, a saw wouldn't work. Uh, you know, you hit a bad, bad strand of, of of stone, and what do you do? You're building a big house out of this color, and it turns to this color. You know, it. The day-to-day -day challenges are the real, uh, real challenge out there. And I sold Texas Stone uh, to Greg, and y'all all know that. And I'm, I didn't do it because I was tired of the stone industry. I did it because I was in bad health at the time. But I don't regret it. Um, at my age, I needed to slow down some with the stress and the everyday dealings. Uh, I'm not ever going to quit working, but I couldn't have, it was the right time for me. But the challenges on a daily basis. Now, when I was younger, I looked forward to them. I, I hit them head on, and I just dared anything to say, <laughs> You can't fix this. Oh, yes, I can. <laughs> so, yeah, that's the day-to-day -day is, is challenging. Um, it's kind of similar to the question that he asked, but what, what's one piece of advice you would give to women in leadership roles in the stone industry? Be yourself. Don't, don't pretend to be something that you're not. You know, you, you're a smart woman. Show your smart woman. Show your leadership. Uh, use your honey. Don't use your vinegar. And if you, I, and I'm a believer in what I just said to you. I really am. Uh, there's men out there that really want to aggravate you. And you can turn around and act just about as bad as they can. Don't do it because they can't turn their honey on. <laughs> Brenda, aside from the 2,500 balustrades that uh, Connie wanted to fabricate, what is the, your most favorite project that you accomplished in those years that you were driving that boat? Oh, wow. Gary, only you'd ask me that question. Um, what is the the what what is the greatest project? Greatest favorite, most enjoyable, you call it. I can tell you what my worst one was, really, <laughs> real quick. Um, my favorite project. Gosh. I have so many. I'm, I, I'll be honest. I am so proud of everything that Texas Stone built. Um, I had the pleasure of building uh, furnishing stone for Mike Shanahan, uh, the 
ex-coach of the Denver Broncos, twice. Once was at 18,000 square feet, and the next one, I think, was 36,000. Um, that was one of my favorites. It was early on, and I love that. I have one in Naples, Florida, that was absolutely challenging. It was a 56,000 square foot home, and uh, enjoyed it tremendously because the man was eccentric, and I had a husband that was eccentric, so I understood the whole process. <laughs> and so, you know, uh, he would, he had an, he'd have an olive tree here, and he wanted the something, and he moved the olive tree and various different things like that. So I enjoyed that one. Um, there, I just enjoyed most everything I, I did. I, I enjoyed going on job site, and I went on job site as much as I possibly could. I love commercial, more so than residential. Residential, to me, is a, a little bit more of a pain because you've got to please the man and you've got to please the woman and sometimes that doesn't come together, but um, I loved everything, every project I ever did. Do you have one of my projects that I did better than the other? We have several that we're very proud to have partnered with you on, and you, you served us well and made us look good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Still working with you, too. Yes, ma'am. Yep. Brenda, when we called around and interviewed friends and families and colleagues, I forget who it was, but somebody asked us to ask you about Jerry Jones and the parking oh. issue. And the what? The parking. Yep. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, Jerry Jones is not one of my favorite people. <laughs> Uh, I'm a big Dallas Cowboy fan, love the Cowboys, and believe it or not, I love the New York Yankees. And I was, at 10 years old, I was going to marry Roger Maris. So I really confuse people. I've, I confuse people a lot anyway. <laughs> but when I have a Cowboy shirt on and a Yankee cap on, they look at me like, what are you doing, you know? But... Um, Jerry Jones and the parking. Uh, let's see. I bought, well, the new AT&T Stadium opened in 2009. And I bought a 30-year license for a Founders Club, which some of you have been to. Um, and believe it or not, Next year will be 15 years. Wow. Yeah. So um, I have the salesperson that sold this to me was a really neat guy um, and very enthusiastic. And I did not have anything to do with this, but in my tickets that I bought, I got a parking pass parking space and it is right at the door I mean you don't have to walk when I'm in a wheelchair I can still get in the cowboy stadium so yeah it's it's pretty cool <laughs> and it has Texas stone quarries on there oh cool oh gosh <laughs> I, I believe that we have to clarify that just a little bit um, I had the pleasure um, of going to the first Cowboy Giant game way back in whenever the stadium opened. And my son Lance and his wife and his best man and his wife and myself and Brenda attended the game. And Brenda had four seats. It was a box and she had four seats for the next 30 years. So she needed to buy two more seats because there were six of us. So that was all fine and dandy. We enjoyed the game, and we sat directly next to Jerry Jones' skybox. So I could reach up like this and literally shake hands with Jerry. Well, after the game, a few weeks passed, 
And Brenda was contacted by the gentleman that sold her the seats. And <laughs> Jerry wanted Joe, to... Joe, you know too much. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry wanted to buy Brenda's seats back because... No, he wanted to take them from me. He didn't want to buy them. <laughs> he wanted to take them from Brenda and replace any seats that she wanted because he wanted to make his skybox larger. Well, you could touch Jerry Jones from my seats, and people were bringing babies up and having the babies, you know, and touching Jerry Jones. Well, babies, I guess, liked him. I didn't. And so, uh, it, you know, and Eric called me, and he said, Jerry wants your seats, and I said, He's not getting my seats. I paid for my seats. He's not getting them. He said, he owns the stadium. I said, I don't care if he owns the stadium. He's not getting my seats. So we started talking, and I have an open mind. <laughs> so we started talking and negotiating, and I did give up my four seats, but I'm closer to the field. I was on this 50-yard line, and now I'm on this side of it, so it's worked out beautifully. I still don't like him, though. <laughs> and I really wish he'd get it, sell the Cowboys to somebody. Uh, I do believe you got a free skybox out of the deal also, if I, I remember correctly. For, for a couple of years, yes. Yeah, a couple of years worth. <laughs> Joe, give the mic back to Kim. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Kim. So, Brenda, yes. uh, do you see any danger in the future of the Sony industry? Is there something that you want to recommend us to avoid? You know, I've always been disturbed by the stone industry not really coming together. And the Natural Stone Council was meant to bring all the organizations together under one roof, and it did for a while, and it, I think it was beneficial. Um, you know, you've got a lot of challenges out there with all kinds of different materials, and we're all natural stone, and you're going to have to come together and be one big unit, and I think it's... it's progress that direction, but you've got more, every year you've got more and more to, you know, challenges with your other materials. Um, I really hope that, that, that there's going to be one big unit one day, okay? Uh, Brenda Wade Agnor here. Can you please explain to us how you raced your Mercedes down the runway oh, to win God. the job in Lansing, Michigan? Can we? Uh, and was the rules uh, uh, abided by? <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's way too many people that know me well in here. Um, okay, Wade w worked for me for three years. He pulled his family out of Augusta, Georgia, to move to West Texas. And um, one of my first, oh, this was the Lansing, Michigan project, wasn't it? Okay. Um, I had not, I had been in the office and I, did all the office work and it got to be too much and I hired Cindy to be the, do all the bookkeeping and keep the books and everything. So I had progressed a little bit and I had to do other things besides answer the phone and do samples and this and that and the other. So we had a beautiful project uh, that we bid, that Wade bid on in Lansing, Michigan, at the Jackson National Life World Headquarters. And this was kind of my first experience with all of this because I was totally in the administrative part of the company. And so the architect, architects, two of them, 
the GC, the owner's reps. So I think there were six people that came out. And um, Wade decides that we're going to have a Mercedes race up and down the runway. <laughs> And so he had a Lexus and I had a Mercedes. And so I, it, <laughs> I went off the runway at 106. And um, I busted a few mesquite trees, didn't I? <laughs> but we got the job. <laughs> so, <yeah. laughs> Now, the bad thing about it is I did put a dent in my Mercedes, <laughs> and I had to go to Dallas the next day to a stone show, and everybody knew I had put a dent in my Mercedes except Connie. <laughs> and so every time he tried to walk around a certain way, I'd direct him around the <laughs> other way. And finally, we get to Dallas, and he said something to me about the car, and I just started bawling. And he said... I said, when did you find out? He said, I knew it when you hit the mesquite tree, silly. <laughs> so, you yeah, know, yeah. Did that answer your question, Wade? Very good. <laughs> Brenda, on behalf of all of us, I think I can speak for all of us at this point. We thank you all for everything you have done mm -hmm. and contributed to this organization. And Women in Stone, we could not be in better hands. We owe it all to you. Thank you. Please join me. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You can try now. <laughs> Y'all aren't going to, you're not going to get the final word. <laughs> no way. <laughs> and everybody can sit down. Uh, I want to say thank you to all of y'all for sharing your lives with me. It's been a great deal to me. Uh, and the women in stone, I, they're fabulous. Thank you for all of your help. Throughout the years, I couldn't have done it without you. You've always been a big part of my life. And uh, I love you all dearly. We and love you right back. These girls are very, very special. We Thank you. you. <laughs> and the, the lady that put makeup on me today said, you've got... Um, Waterproof, Waterproof mascara. mascara. <laughs> <laughs> Kathy, we cannot thank you enough. Kathy has given up golf days. <laughs> she has been with us for the past several months, joining in on our weekly conference calls at the end in preparation for this. And Kathy, tremendous job. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It was an honor. Thank, thank you. Very honored. Kathy had a grandbaby that was going to be born uh, on Friday. Well, Friday? it was Friday, but he was but, supposed to be born this week. Yeah. And so she was just going, what do I do? You know, oh, I was going to be here. <laughs> Mike had to take care of, or those girls would take care of my husband. <laughs> So fortunately, the baby was born last yeah. Friday. Yes, so right. she's all okay. healthy. We could not do this without all of our sponsors as well. Um, Platinum, Gold, everybody. We want to thank everybody for all of your support. And thank you is not even does not describe what we owe. To Gary and Daisha.
they have opened their home and their hearts for us this evening. They have been working tirelessly, both of them, to make this all happen for us. Guys, it has exceeded our expectations tremendously. We cannot thank you enough. You guys are the best. Thank you. Without elaborating, Brenda Edwards is one of the most special women in my life. And in the industry, we have spent countless times together and, and had such an amazing time that when this opportunity arose, there was not a question. It was, of course, yes. So thank you, Brenda Edwards, for everything you have That's not contributed what you to call the industry. Me. That's not what you call me. Mama B. Okay. <laughs> Every Mother's Day, I send her a text <laughs> saying, Mama B, happy Mother's Day. Oh. She is very special in my heart for a variety of reasons that we don't need to talk about right now. <laughs> Kathy, thank you for coming out and doing this. Thank you, thank you for coming to our home. <laughs>